Everybody here understands why mm -hmm. MPAs, marine protected areas, are so critical. Uh, you've heard it again and again about the amount of oxygen that comes from the ocean, the flora, fauna role in climate change, the ability to consume carbon dioxide, contain it. Uh, we've learned alarmingly that in uh, Antarctica, there was a regurgitation of carbon dioxide, and some scientists assert that we maybe don't, that we, we know we don't know, but we don't know where the point of saturation is. So we can't just sit there relying on a consistency going forward, because after all, it is an ecosystem. MPAs are calculated to preserve the ocean biodiversity. And we have many examples around the world. I can give you one from my home state of Massachusetts. A number of years ago when I was in the Senate, we lost almost entirely the fish stock of striped bass. And it was overfished. It was very simple. Overfished by commercial and overfished by uh, recreational fishermen. So we banned for 10 years. We shut down the fishery totally. And now today we have a sustainable uh, fishery that has a catch size that's enforced, uh, a limited season, uh, and it's managed. Marine protected areas either shut down completely and it's no take or you have some take. And the key is how do we proceed? So we have a terrific panel here, a group of people, all of whom are extremely experienced uh, in this field, who are gonna talk about their aspect of MPA. We're gonna allow five minutes for each of them. I think we're starting with Jane Lubchenco, who is uh, going to share with everybody the uh, uh, sort of set the scene. She's a world-renowned environmental scientist, uh, well-respected in the worlds of science and government, academia. She was the Undersecretary of Commerce for our oceans and atmosphere and administrator of the National Ocean of NOAA. And I'm delighted to represent somebody I worked with and admire enormously, Jane Lubchenco. Go ahead, you set the scene. Thank you so much, Secretary Kerry. Uh, distinguished visitors, ladies and gentlemen, it's a grill opportunity to set the scene for this very important panel on marine protected areas. I think we're seeing emerging around the world a new narrative about the ocean. For many of you, especially those of my age uh, or older, uh, for many, many years, uh, for most of human history, as a matter of fact, and until very recently, the ocean was considered too big, too immense, too bountiful to make any difference at all. It was inconceivable that we could change the ocean. In the last couple of decades, however, we have seen dramatic depletion and disruption of ocean ecosystems. We've seen the emergence of new problems that we did not anticipate, and a new narrative has taken hold that is, oh my gosh, look at what we've done. It is so complicated, it's so big, it's too big to fix. It's doom and gloom, it's hopeless. However, like a phoenix arising from the ashes, hope is arising around the world. We have solutions that work. They're not at the scale we need, but we know what needs to be done. And a new narrative is now emerging and all of you are part of that new narrative. This new narrative tells us that the ocean is so important and so central to all of our key problems, whether it's energy, fixing climate change, providing food security, job creation, poverty alleviation, we need the ocean. The ocean is the key to our future. And this new narrative is part of why we are here and marine protected areas are a central pillar of that new narrative. Fortunately, we have a wealth of scientific information about marine protected areas from around the world, and it tells us that marine protected areas can protect biodiversity and habitats. Much of that bounty inside a protected area spills out to the adjacent areas and can help replenish depleted fisheries. Marine protected areas, highly protected ones, can protect those big old fat female fish, as the fishermen call them, that are so key to subsequent generations to recover populations inside protected areas and out. They can restore ecological balance and buffer against accidental mistakes. Science also tells us that highly protected 
marine areas provide reference areas so we can evaluate the impacts of fishing and other extractive activities. They protect culturally and historically important species. And very importantly, they can enhance the resilience of the <coughs> ecosystem to climate change and other environmental changes. These mer merits of protected areas are well known. But we have gotten a little confused about protected areas because there are so many kinds of them. And in fact, there are lots of confusion and arguments. Not all MPAs are the same. They vary considerably. Um, I'm here to share with you a new emerging consensus about being clear and more transparency about protected areas, specifically being very clear about whether protected area is simply announced, for example, at an Our Ocean conference, or whether it has actually been legally designated by a country, or whether it has, the third stage, been implemented with on-the-ground changes in, on the water, uh, or finally, actively managed. Those are not the same. It's important to distinguish them. In similar fashion, being clear about the level of protection against extractive activities is vitally important. Fully and highly protected areas can give us the benefits that I articulated earlier. Many areas around the world are only lightly protected or even minimally protected. They still have conservation benefit, but they won't deliver all of those benefits that I described earlier. And so being clear about what the level of protection is and what the stage of implementation is will go a long way to helping us agree on what we have and what we need. The legacy of our Ocean Conference has been quite significant. When Secretary Kerry initiated this, he emphasized accountability. My students were skeptical, as students are, and said, well, can we look at the information? Have all the promises that have been made actually been delivered? And much to our surprise and delight, looking at all of the MPA commitments that had been made in the first four Our Ocean Conferences, we learned that about half of all of those commitments have now actually been uh, realized. The other half are in progress. So that's fantastic news, and congratulations to everyone that has been responsible for that. Moreover, we've seen as a result of commitments made at the our ocean conferences, 1.4% of the ocean is now protected in implemented MPAs. Not just a promise, it's been delivered. That's over 5 million square kilometers, and half of that is highly protected. If, in fact, we would implement all of the protected areas that have been promised at OOCs, 3.4% or 12 million square kilometers would be protected. That's easy, low-hanging fruit. So I suggest to you, it's time for us to seize the day, if you will, <coughs> pardon the pun, implement what has been announced, be clear and transparent about marine protected areas, and follow the MPA guide by being specific about the stage of establishment and the level of protection. Seek bolder targets. Uh, we need 30% of the ocean in highly protected status by 2030. We need to invest more in management, enforcement, and monitoring. And we need to reframe MPAs as a solution that protects not only the ocean inside those areas, but provides bounty to the rest of the ocean that needs to be managed sustainably. I'm very excited to be hearing the commitments that the rest of our panelists make, and thank you all for joining us. And thank you again, Secretary Kerry, for your fabulous thank you, leadership. Thank you. Jane, thank you very, very much for uh, the accountability analysis, which I think should be very encouraging to everybody uh, and hopefully sets a good example. Folks, we have a long panel, uh, I mean, an important panel of a number of people who are going to make important uh, commitments here and talk about what they're doing. But um, I do need to hold everybody to five minutes, so we've got to try to stay on schedule in respect to everybody else who's coming down the line here. Therefore, let me just go quickly to, to introduce right away, if I may, 
Uh, I hope she's here. I think she's here. The Vice President of Panama and Foreign Minister of Panama, uh, Isabel de Samalo de Alvarado. And uh, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> While she's walking up, I, I'm going to, you have bios, there are bios out there, so I'm not going to run through everybody's full bio, just so we can keep the substance moving as much as possible. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Isabel, you're on. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity of being here and participating in this very important conference. Congratulations to the Indonesian government, to uh, John Kerry for his leadership. And Panama has been a maritime country forever. We are not an island, but we are surrounded by two oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic. We were born to connect. Our landmass did not exist three million years ago. We actually emerged from the oceans to connect North America and South America. And ever since then, we have just been open and connected to the world. Our canal, our ports make us there, make us connected to the rest of the world, make us responsible to the oceans and to uh, contributing to marine protected areas and to the sustainability of the world, as has been already said. Our canal has contributed since our initiation in 1914 to the reduction of 650 million tons of carbon dioxide that have, would have affected marine protected areas otherwise. Through our expanded canal just two years ago, we can propose that in the next 10 years, we will contribute with the reduction of 160 million tons of carbon dioxide that would definitely affect marine protected areas otherwise. We, were, we announced two years ago uh, two protected areas in Panama. With these two protected areas, we increased our coverage of protected areas from 3.5% to 13.5%, thereby surpassing the Aishi objective of 10% of coverage. Now, how to ensure that these marine protected areas continue work together, are implemented, are monitored. We have approved the establishment of a high-level commission that will draw and implement a national strategy for oceans. We will, by the first semester of 2019, have this strategy in place with the roadmap in place in order to ensure that our marine protected areas do what they have to do and further uh, uh, identify possible additional protected areas. Our marine protection and conservation requires, of course, the participation of the private sector, of civil society. Therefore, we will work at this strategy with this participation. It cannot be a government's effort alone. It cannot be a civil society efforts alone. It needs to be the same way this conference is structured, a goal addressed by the different sectors, the different groups is the only way that we're going to get where we need to go if we all work together in collaboration, assisting each other, drawing additional countries, drawing additional sectors in this effort that is an effort for sustainability, an effort just to, to, to continue on the world. It has been said that this affects everything else. And yes, I do believe that this affects everything else. If we look at the sustainable goals, 17 sustainable goals, we are dealing with one of them. However, I am truly convinced that if we do not achieve this one objective, we will run short of every other sustainable development objective because everything is definitely connected and the oceans are definitely connected to everything else. We need to continue to work in aligning with nations that recognize that climate change is there, that climate change is affecting everything else, that unless we work together globally to change this, um, this path, uh, we're not going to be able to address the sustainable development goals in general. We will all be affected, no matter what we do. We will all be affected particularly island states, 
I would have to say. I would like to mention here the Caribbean. The Caribbean, as many other island states, are affected. We need to worry about them. That is why Panama will inaugurate in the next couple of weeks a humanitarian hub to respond on disasters. I'll just like to end by announcing our interest to host the Our Oceans Conference in the future, perhaps 2021. Uh, this is a, um, a message of our commitment as a country that is a maritime country that is surrounded by water that understand that we need to continue to work together in order to maintain the oceans and everything that is related, all the life that is related to it. Thank you very much. Well, Isabel, thank you very much. Thank you, obviously, for that generous offer of Panama to line up here to continue this important work, and we're very, very appreciative, needless to say. And I appreciate the partnership with you and, and, and with Panama on a number of different things. We appreciate your leadership. Uh, my pleasure now to, to ask uh, uh, His Excellency Philippe Germain to start coming up if he is here somewhere. Uh, he serves, uh, as I think all of you know, as president to the government of New Caledonia. Uh, and I know they are engaged in some important steps where he will relate to you. As he comes up, till he gets here, and Mike, I just say to everybody quickly, the goal for MPAs under everybody's judgment is 30% of the ocean. We're currently at 3.7%, and uh, only 2% of that is strongly protected. So you see how important the mission is and how much work we have left to do, and I'm delighted with Isabel's announcement, which is another step forward in, in trying to meet that goal. Your Excellency, Mr. President, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Pull the mic uh, closer to you. I think you've got to talk quite close to it. Apologize, I will speak in French. Uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, en 2014, la Nouvelle-Calédonie a classé la totalité de sa zone économique exclusive, soit 1,3 million de kilomètres carrés, en parc naturel de la mer de Corail, donc en zone marine protégée. Cet écrin de biodiversité accueille une fosse de subduction, 150 monts sous-marins, un tiers des récifs pristines de la planète, 2000 espèces de poissons et 300 de corail. Il constitue également un site privilégié pour la reproduction des baleines et des tortues vertes. En 2018, un plan de gestion a été adopté euh, au terme de quatre ans de discussion et de concertation au sein d'un comité de gestion qui regroupe les institutions, les coutumiers, les acteurs socioprofessionnels et la société civile, auxquels, depuis 2018, nous avons ajouté un comité scientifique. Conformément aux engagements que la Nouvelle-Calédonie a pris en 2016 lors de la conférence Our Ocean, la Nouvelle-Calédonie a classé en réserve la totalité de ses récifs pristines soit 7000 km² en réserve intégrale et 21 000 km² de réserve naturelle renforcée, donc également interdit d'accès. Le tourisme professionnel est désormais réglementé et encadré. Il n'est plus autorisé dans les réserves naturelles et bien sûr dans les réserves intégrales. Une loi est également en cours d'examen par les institutions calédoniennes, le Congrès de la Nouvelle-Calédonie, pour interdire l'importation, la fabrication, l'usage de sacs plastiques, de gobelets, assiettes, couverts et autres objets jetables en plastique, et cela pour l'année 2019. La Nouvelle-Calédonie veut faire de la préservation de la biodiversité marine un nouveau modèle de croissance durable autour de quatre piliers. Créer un hotspot de la recherche internationale, créer un pôle d'excellence pour l'innovation, notamment en faveur de l'observation, de la surveillance et de la sécurisation 
du parc naturel de la mer de Corail, faire de la Nouvelle-Calédonie un laboratoire de développement d'activités économiques éco-responsables et enfin créer un centre régional de préservation et de valorisation de la biodiversité marine. C'est pourquoi aujourd'hui j'ai l'honneur euh, de vous informer que la Nouvelle-Calédonie prend de nouveaux engagements. Le premier, d'attribuer un statut de protection élevé à sa fosse de subduction, au, au mont sous-marin et aux îles Walpool, Matthew et Hunter du parc naturel de la mer de Corail d'ici 2019. Les études et les discussions qui seront menées avec le comité de gestion concerneront un nouvel espace de protection compris entre 200 000 et 400 000 2 la Nouvelle-Calédonie prend également l'engagement de créer en concertation d'ici 2020 un comité régional de réflexion autour de la, du parc naturel de la mer de Corail avec l'Australie, la Papouasie-Nouvelle-Guinée, le Vanuatu et les îles Salomon pour une gestion de la mer de Corail représentant un espace et une surface totale de 5000 km. Ce comité régional aura pour objectif, premièrement, de signer un cadre de coopération, deuxièmement, de, montrer, de monter un projet intégré transnational pour renforcer et mettre en œuvre un outil de financement pérenne pour développer et garantir la bonne gestion de la mer de Corail. Mesdames et Messieurs, la Nouvelle-Calédonie est dépositaire d'un patrimoine naturel universel d'exception. Cela nous oblige, mais ça oblige collectivement la communauté internationale ainsi que la mobilisation de tous les scientifiques, des États, des ONG, des fondations pour répondre à ce défi de comment faire de la préservation de la biodiversité un nouveau modèle de développement. Je vous remercie. Merci Philippe, c'est formidable. Thank you very, very much. I think you can tell from the reaction of the audience, everybody here uh, is extremely appreciative and that is exactly the kind of step uh, of leadership that spills down and uh, builds up at the same time. So we're very, very appreciative. My pleasure now to uh, introduce Abraham Gorham, Bram Gorham. Uh, Bram, why don't you start up here while I just quickly introduce is Bram here? Aha. Uh -huh. Bram is uh, uh, representing the Maya Raja Ampat Customary Council, and he's been extremely welcome, extremely active in conservation of marine waters, major efforts uh, for creation of conservation areas, and we're delighted to have him. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, John Kerry. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, now I'm. I use uh, Indonesian language. Yeah. Uh, kami di Raja Ampat, <coughs> Papua Barat. Masyarakat adat menganggap bahwa tanah adalah ibu dan laut adalah ayah. <coughs> Karena kami menganggap bahwa dari tanah dan laut itu akan menyediakan kebutuhan hidup uh, kami di Raja Ampat sehingga mereka akan uh, mereka harus kami jaga dan kami lindungi dengan baik karena dari sana kami bisa makan uh, oleh sebab itu tanah dan laut bagi kami kami sangat menghormati dan akan menjaga mereka seperti orang tua kami sendiri dalam pengelolaan uh, sumber daya alam yang di dalamnya memberikan kami hidup. Filosofi dari orang Papua atau masyarakat Raja Ampat secara khusus menganggap uh, tanah dan laut itu adalah satu kesatuan yang perlu dijaga dan dilindungi. Selama ribuan tahun Ribuan tahun uh, kami sangat menghargai kearifan lokal uh, 
budaya kami dengan memanfaatkan sumber daya alam secara terbatas dan berkelanjutan. Nah, kearifan lokal masyarakat adat di Papua, lebih khusus di Raja Ampat ini, kita tahu bahwa akan mengalami pergeseran dengan eh, adanya perubahan teknologi, perubahan zaman, bagaimana kita tidak akan hidup sendiri lagi, tetapi kita akan hidup dengan komunitas masyarakat dunia yang akan menggeser kehidupan tradisional kita. Oleh sebab itu, kami perlu menjaga dan meningkatkan tradisional kita seiring dengan perubahan zaman. Berubahnya perubahan zaman akan merubah tatanan hidup kami, tetapi komitmen kita untuk menjaga dan melestarikan sumber daya alam yang kita miliki harus itu menjadi perhatian kami di Raja Ampat. Sudah banyak inisiatif dan dari kolaborasi yang dilakukan untuk melindungi dan mengelola kawasan hutan. Misalnya kita ketahui bahwa di negara kita ada undang-undang nomor 27 tahun 2007 tentang pengelolaan sumber daya eh, perikanan terutama pulau-pulau kecil dan pesisir. Dan ada beberapa aturan-aturan hukum di negara kita dan juga ada inisiatif dari Marine Protect Area yang dilakukan oleh teman-teman dari NGO dan bekerja sama dengan kami masyarakat adat juga pemerintah lokal. Nah, semua inisiatif itu telah kita lakukan. Tetapi untuk melanjutkan pekerjaan besar bagaimana masyarakat ikut terlibat di dalam pengelolaan dan perlindungan kawasan dan itu menjadi subjek utama dalam pengelolaan ini yang menjadi esensi kita dan ini yang harus menjadi perhatian kita bersama. Nah, pada tahun 2010, sebelumnya itu banyak inisiatif, tetapi pada tahun 2010 itu teman-teman dari RER kemudian datang kepada kami di Dewan Adat Dewan Adat Suku Maya untuk memperkenalkan konsep Territorial Use Rights for Fishing dan kami menganggap bahwa konsep ini seiring dan sejalan dengan apa yang eh, yang kami selama ini lakukan, yaitu akhirnya kami menyebutkan dengan kawasan konservasi adat yang sesuai dengan eh, spesial otonomi eh, di Provinsi Papua Barat. Dan inilah esensi daripada otonomi khusus bagaimana kawasan eh, Perikanan adat ini harus dikelola dengan baik oleh masyarakat adat di Raja Ampat. Dalam kawasan perikanan adat, sebuah entitas sosial berdasarkan desa atau menggambarkan wilayah laut yang biasanya kami gunakan, itu kami sudah memetahkan bagaimana daerah yang akan dipakai untuk mancing, ada daerah yang uh, untuk penangkapan ikan secara terbatas, tetapi ada daerah yang perlu dilindungi dengan kearifan lokal kita yang kita sebut dengan kawasan-kawasan keramat yang tidak boleh kita sentuh. Nah, kita juga harus memastikan keberlanjutan wilayah laut dan sumber daya yang terkandung di dalamnya. Masyarakat menetapkan aturan penangkapan ikan dan rencana pengelolaan dengan keluarga, dikeluarkan peraturan-peraturan kampung dan peraturan adat. Kami melihat bahwa Marine Protect Area telah berhasil mengatur kawasan laut sesuai dengan peruntukannya dan peraturan yang telah dikeluarkan. Tetapi bagaimana untuk mengatur tentang e, siapa yang harus melakukan dan menjadi subjek utama di dalam pengelolaan kawasan perikanan berbasis adat. Nah disinilah konsep yang diterapkan oleh teman-teman dari RER ini sesuai dengan budaya dan tradisi kami di Raja Ampat. Langkah penting ya, sekarang yang ada yang akan kita lakukan adalah bagaimana membuat konsep kawasan perikanan adat yang dipahami oleh semua komunitas di Raja Ampat untuk mendorong kepatuhan terhadap aturan penangkapan ikan dan untuk menginternalisasi konsep dan aturan ke dalam nilai-nilai hidup kami di, di Raja Ampat. Untuk itu perlu kita melakukan program adopsi perilaku yang sistematis dan teman-teman dari RER memiliki cara-cara inovatif untuk melibatkan 
orang-orang melalui beberapa game, di antaranya bagaimana uh, game tentang kompetisi memasak, kemudian bagaimana permainan-permainan dan diskusi, uh, fokus grup diskusi untuk meningkatkan kapasitas dari masyarakat adat untuk pengelolaan perikanan berkelanjutan dan konservasi laut kepada masyarakat itu sendiri. Nah, Marine Protect Area dan kawasan perairan perikanan adat dan inisiatif konservasi lainnya telah menjaga sumber daya alam kita yang berharga dan mengurangi ancaman terhadap perairan laut dan ekosistem di Raja Ampat. Kami melihat Raja Ampat adalah milik kami, suku Maya, tetapi hari ini bukan itu hanya memberikan kehidupan kepada kami sendiri suku Maya, tetapi juga memberikan dampak bagi komunitas masyarakat dunia. Ini menjadi hal yang sangat penting dan oleh sebab itu dapat untuk memastikan bahwa Lautan Raja Ampat masih memiliki fungsi wanduku kehidupan untuk generasi mendatang. Dan kami suku Maya mempunyai komitmen bahwa 1,4 juta hektar laut di Raja Ampat itu akan kami jaga dan kami akan uh, melindungi dengan baik dan ada 266 ribu hektar itu menjadi kawasan perairan adat yang benar-benar diperuntukkan untuk pengelolaan secara tradisional. Saya pikir itu yang bisa saya sampai uh, dapat sampaikan kepada kita di sore hari. Terima kasih. Bram, thank you very, very much. You're the only community representative uh, here, and I think what you've just offered in terms of your work and also the set-aside is very significant, and we can't do this without you and your leadership, so thank you very, very much. Um, I've been delighted to work with the uh, Pew Bertarelli Ocean Legacy Project, which is a partnership between the Bertarelli uh, Foundation under the guidance of co-chair Donna Bertarelli and also the Pew Charitable Trust. And I'd like Donna to begin walking up here, uh, if I could ask her to. Um, we uh, have uh, had an opportunity to really spearhead this effort to create the marine protected areas, and nobody has done more on this regard than Donna and her uh, leadership of a philanthropic organization established by her family, which has done some major, major set-aside work. So Donna, thank you so much. And I'd sort of throw a question at you to frame perhaps your discussion of what you're going to do further. But you've had so much experience working with governments, with non-government, the NGOs, the participants, the stakeholders. Maybe as you describe what you're going to do, you could just share what you've learned about the, this sort of process of, of what happens with governments that change and all of a sudden you're the ones left carrying the ball. Thank you, John. Um, yes, I think the simple answer is um, hard work and um, persistence. It took us, and I wasn't alone, six years to, and three, and to work with three consecutive governments to create the marine protected area around Easter Island, and today to continue to work with the local community and the present government to enforce it. And that is why at the Bertrelli Foundation, we spend a lot of time talking to everyone in the area where an MPA might be introduced and continue to do so once, once it's in place. Of course, the government of the day, but also the politicians from other parties, the NGOs and the local people in the community Essentially, it's all about forging a broad and deep understanding and collaboration so that everybody, everybody buys into the plan, believes in it, and strives to make it a success. That way, there's much better chance of maintaining momentum when individual politicians or government leave office. This is why it's so important to have an event like today's discussion as well. Everyone in this room share one common goal, to make the ocean and the world a better place for future generations. And we all know how important the ocean is to our own individual lives and to the health of humankind. The challenges facing our ocean are global and it will take all of us to find solutions. I would like to remember that our ocean is a conference 
for action. The, the challenges um, are many. And um, John, you're asking me what it takes. I believe it also takes bravery. And there are a lot of brave people in this room. But is that enough? Do we have enough time? Since you launched Our Ocean in 2014, a much needed and essential initiative, through our combined hard work, persistence, and bravery, how much have we all contributed to increase the marine protected area around the world? Well, Jane told us 1.4% in four years. So my question is, how are we going to meet 10% by 2020 and 30% by 2030? At that speed, I don't know how we're going to make it. So, but I don't want to sound too pessimistic because in recent years, we have seen tremendous movement by governments making the commitment to protect their waters. And I thank them for their actions. But sadly, we need to do more and act faster. That is why I am delighted to announce a new initiative to continue this wave of ocean conservation, the Pew Bertrelli Ocean Ambassadors, co-chaired by our moderator here today, former US Secretary of State John Kerry, and former UK Prime Minister David Cameron, the Ocean Ambassadors are committed to promoting marine conservation, especially large-scale marine protected areas. They are being joined by other global leaders who have demonstrated their commitment to protecting the ocean. We are fortunate to have them here with us today in the room. The former president of the Seychelles, James Michel, the former foreign minister of Chile, Heraldo Munoz, and mother of Micronesia, Carlota Leon Guerrero of Guam. Each and every one of them will draw on their unique experiences to advance a strategy to secure and implement marine protected areas around the world that will contribute to a healthier and more resilient ocean. I am extremely grateful and honored to have them on my side and the Pew Charitable Trust for this important task. It's vital, this effort we took forward to a collectively working to safeguard our ocean for future generations. And it's great that politicians who have left office want to continue their commitment to protecting the ocean and to encourage and support their political successors. And I wish to end by leaving you with this thought from a Native American proverb, a thought that has inspired me all these years and continue to do so every day. We don't inherit earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want you to know how efficient Donna is. She wound up exactly two seconds before her five minutes uh, gets the job done. Uh, Donna, thank you. Thank you for what you and your family have been doing. It's really spectacular and very, very important. Can I ask Dr. Fanny Duvert to begin walking up? Uh, quickly introduced. Uh, uh, Fanny is the coordinator of the Marine Program at UNESCO's World Heritage Center in Paris. Uh, the mission program ensures that the 49 World Heritage Sites are properly managed, sustainably managed, and she recently wrote an article in Nature as to why not investing in uh, marine world heritage is a lost opportunity for the ocean. So, Fanny, thank you for your leadership. We're happy to welcome you. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, UNESCO plays an international lead role in ocean science through its Intergovernmental inter Oceanographic Commission, and it will lead the UN Decade for Ocean Science that commences in 2021. And my colleague, uh, Executive Secretary of IOC, will talk a little bit more about that tomorrow uh, at 10.15.
But the question really at the session, uh, Secretary Kerry, is what, what does UNESCO do for marine protected areas? We're not necessarily involved in creating new marine protected areas, yet UNESCO has a very important role in international oversight to make sure that some of those marine protected areas are well managed, are effectively managed. We're all familiar with UNESCO World Heritage Sites. World Heritage was created in 1972 and has since become the hallmark of protection of some of the globe's most iconic places. Today, the UNESCO World Heritage List includes 49 marine sites, ocean places, 49 flagship marine protected areas, some of them very well known, the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador, Coiba National Park in Panama, Komodo National Park here in Indonesia, to name just a few. Now, while heritage status for marine protected areas has lifted entire regions out of poverty, and some of the best examples in South Africa and Philippines. World heritage recognition provides millions of jobs for people all around the world. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia alone generates about 65,000 jobs and contributes about $6 billion annually to the GDP of the country. World heritage is really built on the premise that certain places on earth are so important, they're so unique and exceptional, that their protection should not be left to just one nation. That is why in its day-to-day -day operations, the UNESCO World Heritage Convention unites 193 nations behind a common and shared commitment to protect the world's most special, most unique places, including those ocean treasures for future generations. Yet, despite having received the highest international designation for protection, and despite being backed in their conservation by virtually every nation on this planet, still, these flagship marine protected areas suffer seriously. Still 30% of these MPAs are illegally or unsustainably fished. Coal power plants are being built in areas that threaten to destroy some of the most unique mangrove systems that huma humanity might ever see. Coastal development still goes ahead without proper environmental considerations, which impact our oceans substantially for decades, or perhaps hundreds of years to come. Climate change. UNESCO's latest scientific assessment, which was published last June, confirmed once again that limiting global temperatures 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial times, consistent with the Paris Climate Agreement, is absolutely critical if we do want to see some of our World Heritage listed coral reefs survive. But all of these challenges, it should not deter us, and it doesn't. UNESCO is a story of hope. Secretary Kerry, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is in this context of hope that I have the honor to announce a new, first of its kind, $9 million commitment to build cutting edge climate resilience in an initial five of the world's most treasured coral reefs and their communities. The initial five sites are the lagoons of New Caledonia, Palau, Rock Islands, Australia's Ningaloo Reefs, and Great Barrier Reef, and the second largest reef system on our planet, the Belize Barrier Reef. The initiative is unique. It is led by an international consortium, private and public, including UNESCO's World Heritage Center, the Rockefeller Foundation and its pioneering 100 resilient cities, BHP Foundation, the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, and the environmental engineering consultancy firm, ACOM. I want to end this with a reflection. When you work every day across 49 marine protected areas, which the international community has designated as being of outstanding universal value to all of humanity, and is being backed in their conservation by virtually every nation on this planet through a legally binding commitment to protect them, one may wonder if we cannot protect these marine protected areas, really what hope 
is there for the rest of our oceans. Thank you. Well, from my point of view, you just made a powerful argument for why no one should ever talk about defunding UNESCO. Um, is, uh, Fanny, thank you very much. Uh, is, uh, there he is. Is that the Prime Minister coming up? Oh, Brett. Is the Prime Minister here? Okay. Brett, you come on up. I, uh, we were waiting for the Prime Minister. I thought he was going to be here and ready to go. But Brett uh, Jenks is the uh, President and CEO of RARE, which is a global conservation organization, uh, basically working across the board to try to bring people together to understand uh, the concept of uh, partnership in sustainability. So, Brett, thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you, Secretary Kerry, and thank you, Dr. Lubchenco. Um, conservation of the ocean is ultimately about people. For over 40 years, RARE has made people part of the solution by empowering communities to adopt more sustainable behaviors. The last seven years, we've focused for the first time on coastal overfishing because we must work with the billions of people who depend on the ocean if we're going to protect it. Our experience over these last seven years leaves me with three conclusions. One, we desperately need to prioritize coastal fisheries. Coastal overfishing is the greatest near-term threat to the ocean and the one that's getting the least attention. Two, there is an alternative to overfishing in these coastlines. By tapping into the self-interest and sense of pride of thousands of fishers, we see fisheries recovering. And three, coastal fisheries are now an investable proposition. We can finance their recovery at scale by blending philanthropy, public funding, and private capital. So let's go through these one at a time very quickly. Why is our neglect of small-scale fisheries such a big deal? First, if we consider how they deliver on global targets, you can see that if we played a game of SDG bingo, which is my new favorite game, you'd win uh, very quickly just by listing the many values of addressing coastal overfishing. So coastal overfishing threatens marine biodiversity because it takes place in the most critical habitats. SDG 14, life below water. Coastal fisheries account for 95% of fishing jobs, and most of them are in developing countries. Number one, no poverty. Women fill 90% of post-harvest jobs in small-scale fisheries. That's five, if you're keeping track, uh, gender equity. Small-scale fishers catch half the global fish catch, almost all of it consumed by humans. Two, no hunger, and so on and so on. Coastal fisheries should be a much bigger priority for all of us. Fortunately, there's a viable alternative. RARE's leading a partnership with more than 80 NGOs, government agencies, and private investors that we call Fish Forever. The Fish Forever model empowers coastal fishers with exclusive access to manage their own local waters. Managed access is a form of turf, or territorial use rights for local fishers. These rights come in exchange for responsible management and designing of inf and enforcing uh, marine reserves, which accelerate fish recovery. This technical approach is paired with community behavior change, and there are four behaviors that make a significant difference. Fishers first register to fish legally. They participate in fishery management. They report catch and they use data for decision making. And they comply with their own rules, like where and when to fish, what gear to use. So what's the ROI on these four behavior changes? As it turns out, it's quite significant. We have seen over the past uh, five years in more than 200 communities in the Philippines and Indonesia a significant transformation. In green, you see what changed inside those fish sanctuaries. An average 390% increase in biomass. In blue, you see what happened in the exclusive fishing areas, and even more impressive given those are the fishing areas, 
111% increase. What better incentive for fishers to protect marine protected areas than getting a piece of the upside? Some of this data is from Raja Ampat, where we heard from our friends, 19 tribal leaders recently designated the world's largest turf reserve network, 210,000 hectares, to protect their food security, their culture, and their livelihoods. The same process is unfolding in Mozambique, the Philippines, Brazil, and now we're expanding into the Pacific Islands with support from Oceans 5, uh, Sven Lindblad, Summit Foundation, to the Mesoamerican Reef. Looking back on these seven years, it's easy to see how philanthropy can create an innovative and investable opportunity. I want to recognize Bloomberg Philanthropies for their transformative commitment to prioritizing restoring coastal fisheries. Looking forward, we see a future where blended finance for nature is as common as it is for bridges, roads, stadiums, and schools. To do our part, RARE commits to mobilize an additional $53 million by 2021 in support of sustainable small-scale fisheries and continued implementation of the Fish Forever model. Since 2017, we've mobilized over 47 million, including from the governments of Sweden, Germany, and USAID, as well as Bloomberg Philanthropies. And we remain committed to reaching the $100 million target that we pledged last year. In Indonesia, finally, we will work with the provinces of Southeast Sulawesi and West Papua to support 15,000 small-scale fishing households and to manage, help them manage, on their own terms, 500,000 new hectares of local uh, fishing waters in a sustainable manner. We look forward to supporting these fisheries and these communities in partnership with many of you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
communities of the South. The system of parks includes large World Heritage areas and Ramsar sites, which as you know are wetlands uh, of important uh, and of international importance. Now almost 70% of our Australian marine parks have been given a high level of protection at the same time as we ensure benefits for sustainable fishing and tourism. A sustainable ocean economy can be built only by first ensuring we have healthy ocean ecosystems. And John, every speaker has reinforced that point uh, in this session. Of all our marine parks, of course, the best known uh, is the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and Australians just call it the reef. Uh, like reefs all over the world, however, the Great Barrier Reef is under a lot of pressure, uh, particularly from warmer water temperatures, from global warming and the change in the chemistry of the ocean about which Secretary Kerry spoke so passionately and knowledgeably uh, earlier today. Now, we have made, the government has made, its largest single ever investment in reef protection, more than half a billion dollars, to support its health and resilience. The Australian and Queensland state governments in partnership with experts from conservation, industry, indigenous communities and other groups have detailed a 35-year Reef 2050 long-term sustainability plan for the Great Barrier Reef. And the plan sets out the high priority activities that are needed to build the health and resilience of the reef in, face, in the face of a changing climate. Uh, the challenges facing the reef, of course, demand more than government-only support and this new partnership will broaden the opportunities for both public and private funding for reef protection. And I want to acknowledge the uh, great work that has been done by so many philanthropists and philanthropically supported foundations uh, to support the reef. Now, to raise further philanthropic investment, uh, the government has entered into an innovative partnership with the not-for-profit Great Barrier Reef Foundation, which we've heard just a moment ago. In addition to its wonderful natural value, the reef supports 64,000 jobs and generates 6.4 billion Australian dollars annually into the regional economy. Now, looking outwards to neighbours who also manage extensive coral reef regions, including our friends in the Pacific, so many of whom are represented here today. We are, after all, a Pacific island, well, plus arguably also an Indian Ocean island as well, but a big island, but we know that uh, our neighbours in the Pacific face huge challenges in terms of reef management and challenges that are not, that where they don't have the same uh, economic resources that Australia has uh, to deal with its uh, marine challenges. So that is why we need to work closely together and continue to provide strong support. Uh, so we value our international partnerships. We've allocated two million Australian dollars to support our co-hosting of the International Coral Reef Initiative uh, working with Indonesia and Mo Monaco. Now, the 500 million Aussie dollars commitment of new funding is entirely focused on protection of the reef, and it's addressing a range of local pressures uh, that will ensure sustainable use. Improving water quality is absolutely essential. Working with farmers to reduce fertiliser and pest pesticide runoff into the ocean and improve land use practice to prevent soil erosion. And these are a whole range of measures, many of them are obvious and practical, but nonetheless all taking time and money to deliver. Uh, removing or eradicating as far as we can the crown of thorns starfish is critically important and we are applying the best science to do that. It does so much damage to coral reefs. And in all of this, working closely with indigenous communities to improve the management of the protected area. We're allocating a further $100 million to continue to our science community, conti continue their work to develop corals that are more resilient in the face of warmer waters. I mean, again, harking back to what John Kerry said earlier today, uh, the ocean is getting warmer, considerably so, even if all of the great uh, objectives of Paris, the Paris Climate Treaty, were achieved uh, and uh, uh, political resistance, if you like, to action on climate change evaporated. Nonetheless, there is a huge amount of warming in the system already, a lot of momentum already. And so we have to live with that 
and do everything we can to ensure reefs can be more resilient. So a lot of that work is being done by AIMS at uh, the Australian Institute of Marine Science in Townsville. Plastic waste is obviously an enormous agenda issue and it's been discussed here at this conference. We're announcing today that we're providing up to five million Australian dollars to the Tangaroa Blue Foundation, working in partnership with Conservation Volunteers Australia to deliver community cleanup events and education and awareness raising activities to reduce marine debris across the Great Barrier Reef region over the next five years. And in that region, the Tangaroa Blue Foundation has worked with over a thousand partners and more than 120,000 volunteers to remove over a thousand tonnes of marine debris from the Australian coastline. These community efforts are enormously important. Not only do they clean up beaches uh, and estuaries and waterways, but they also raise awareness so that people and communities are going to be less likely to allow debris to get into the waterways uh, in, the, in the future. And I just want to acknowledge today the extraordinary work of the great Australian conservationist, and like you, John, a sailor Ian Kiernan, who died recently, who founded uh, Clean Up Australia, a really enormous national community cleanup movement. Now, Australia has the third largest marine domain, and we have been and always will be a world leader in marine park protection and management and a strong partner for everybody here. So thank you, John. I want to thank our hosts, Indonesia, President Joko Widodo and his ministers, uh, Retno and, and Susie, for their terrific support. Uh, and I want to wish everybody a very successful Oceans Conference. Thank you. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, Malcolm, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I think your announcements, coupled with the other announcements that have been made here, have greater meaning because of what Jane Lubchenco shared with us. And I want to thank her students at Oregon State for doing the analysis they did. These are not just pro forma, happy talk announcements being made at a conference. Uh, these things are happening. And it's raising awareness, it's raising consciousness, and it's increasing the willingness of other governments that haven't thought about it to not want to be left out and certainly not want to be in the hall of shame, so to speak, as accountability continues. And it's going to continue. It's going to grow. Let me just ask the organizers. I, I'm not aware here. Uh, we we're supposed to have a little bit of discussion. Do we have time or is our time up? No, the time is up completely. Time up. is up. Okay, boss. I, I just want you all to know, I've been sitting here, I just noticed it while I was sitting up here, that we're all sort of underwater. And I'm looking at the dancing surface of the water up there. For any of you who've dived, you know, you're waiting to get out and break out into the sunlight. Um, so at, at least for those of you who haven't, this is an enormous opportunity for you to practice holding your breath. Um, I want to thank everybody, this panel, uh, is really significant. I wanted to ask people, and here's what I ask you all to think about. Can we get to 30%? What is it going to take to get to what people are telling us we have to get to? That's the next step challenge here that we need to cope with as we go to Norway, as we think about what we're going to accomplish in the course of this year, and how we up the performance. Uh, because 3.7% if it were strongly or 5% strongly protected, it's just like that goal that we know with respect to 0.5 degrees and 1.5 and where we're heading. We have to up our game. And I don't have the complete answer to it except global leadership, particularly from the G20, the most powerful nations in the world with the most amount of money, with the biggest economies, have the greatest opportunity to change this direction. But I leave you all with the thought um, and when we convene uh, next in Norway, I hope we can build so significantly on what's been proposed here today. And I thank every one of the panelists. Uh, I know you had to streamline uh, and you've come a long way, but everybody here appreciates your participation and your leadership by example. Thank you.